Good afternoon. How's everybody doing? Everybody enjoy your lunch? I think we're getting people gathering in. I um, just want to say good afternoon again for those who are just joining us. My name is Jeff Davidson. I'm executive director at Sailor Academy. If you weren't here this morning for a little presentation, just as a reminder, we're a nonprofit global initiative uh, educating people around the world, mostly underserved communities. We're offering courses in very key foundational subjects like English and, and tech and all those sorts of things, but also career-focused opportunities like decision-making, leadership, and software engineering, all so really interesting stuff. We've got students in 185 countries who have collectively earned over half a million certificates across those areas. And I think I have, do I have a couple slides up? couple slides we're showing you a couple stu actual students um, uh, that are earning these certificates and that we can we can kind of skip over that but whether they're around the world or right here in DC there are large numbers of people who simply just don't have access to education know that access um, you know there's a future future engineers future doctors future everything out there uh, but they can just get that chance and that is what open education is really all about and very few people have championed that ideal uh, more than our next speaker uh, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce the trustee of the Sailor Academy Michael Saylor Michael's the chairman and CEO of MicroStrategy a global leader in software uh, excuse me and um, in enterprise analytics and mobility software. We've got 2,500 plus employees around the world. So Michael's uh, very gonna bring a very global employer perspective. Earlier someone mentioned lack of employer uh, perspective in the morning session. Well, we've got a little bit of that coming through Michael. Uh, Michael's full bio is in your program, but you'll note that he went to our, uh, MIT and earned a couple, scholar uh, earned a couple degrees um, through an ROTC scholarship. Uh, and so he came out with no debt. And he's mentioned more than once that that was his impetus to try to give back, uh, to make, to try to offer a first class education to people who can't get to a place like MIT, but also anywhere just without, without the debt. So you can free people up to go tap into their potential. Um, his philanthropy extends to many areas, but his uh, commitment to education is just really extraordinary. Not just giving resources, but time, energy, and ideas. So we're very appreciative of Michael uh, helping us put this event on and just for his um, continued uh, support through our whole enterprise and, and reaching all these students around the world. So please join me in welcoming Michael Saylor. Thank you, Jeff. <clears throat> um, and thank you for coming here today. Uh, I thought I'd... Uh, share a few, uh, a few observations of mine about um, what's going on in the marketplace uh, from a technology uh, employer's point of view, some observations I see looking at uh, big tech right now and then the implications for what we're all doing together in open education. Um, first, uh, a couple of trends. You know, if you look at 
the year 2019 and you ask, how has the world changed in the past 20 years? Well, there's a lot more computing power, like a, like a lot more, like a, a thousand X more, maybe 10,000 X more on average per unit. There's a lot more memory, computer memory that is. Uh, I have a, this is an Apple Watch, but it's a Series 5 Apple Watch. It's got 32 gigabytes of RAM in the watch. And the phone has 500 gigabytes. 500 gigabytes is, um, when, uh, when we used to do data analytics for the Target Corporation back in the mid-90s, the entire retail chain could store everything they did for uh, like three years in 200 gigabytes. So to give you a sense of, of what we've got, um, we're rapidly able to uh, keep track of a lot more information and then the processing powers increase. So I gotta say, it feels like it's like an order of 1,000 to 10,000. There's a lot more elasticity now in the marketplace and especially elasticity as um, typified by uh, cloud offerings like Azure and AWS, which are, uh, are uh, generating a huge amount of excitement and interest. Uh, what does it mean? Uh, it means that um, instead of taking a year to hire 50 employees and spending $20 million to set up a data center in Singapore, you could do up the entire thing in 12 minutes with a click. <clears throat> and then if you made a mistake, you can unwind it. So uh, what is the implication of all that? Well, I mean, clearly, um, if you've got a piece of software that does something, you've now got 10,000 X the resources to run the software on. So that's really good for people that have good software. Now, if you happen to be in the business of manually laboring to replace a piece of software or doing something uh, using your hands instead of a computer, it's just getting thousands of times more painful for you. Uh, it's, uh, and it's not going to end. And so what happens? Um, well, what, one thing that happens is the rise of big tech. This is why Google, Facebook, Apple, and Amazon are, in essence, crushing everybody. And, you know, they're rolling over and uh, rolling up any kind of competitor because they've got the software and they, and they keep doubling down the amount of software engineers to make it better. And as the cost of running the software falls, the people, why is Microsoft worth nearly a trillion dollars today? If you have a lot of software and the world relies on more software, then you have an advantage. So, so software laden companies are being lifted and unautomated companies, manual bricks and mortar companies, just keep, keep getting hammered and hammered and hammered. And so while we have um, more of one thing, we have 10,000 times more computing power than we had. What do we have less of in 20 years? And uh, this is best illustrated by the observation that when I was in high school, there were three channels and there was primetime TV from 8 till 11 and there was like one TV show between 11 and 11.30 and then there was just a bunch of bars on the screen. <laughs> and if you were technically apt, you could actually figure out how to get like the PBS station. So you might get a fourth. And that was pretty much it. Right? And so at 11.30, you probably just went to sleep because there was no Netflix, there was no Amazon Prime, there was no Disney Plus, there was no HBO Go, there was no Apple TV Plus, there was no free infinite, there was no YouTube. If you actually look at the most popular websites in the world, <clears throat> 20 years ago, um, at the top you had AOL. And uh, then there was a burst where Yahoo came on. And then you start to see uh, this, uh, this little engine that could, which is Google, that comes out of nowhere and just starts to get more and more powerful. And then right behind it in the caboose is YouTube. And Google and YouTube run all the way to the top and eventually Facebook, the prodigy, comes along. And today it's like Google, YouTube, and Facebook. But uh, 
and it's not like Google's actually slowing down. Google's actually widening the gap. In the last three to four years, they went from being the top with a lead of this much to being on top with a lead of this much. In fact, two-thirds of all of the usage, as far as I can see, are Google and YouTube. Like this one company, and Google owns YouTube. Right? Yeah, so this one company has like 70% of all the views. Right? And, and uh, <clears throat> it's, it's got a lot of implications. Like, what is YouTube? Well, YouTube is just millions and millions of hours of streaming video, but a lot of it's didactic. There's a lot of educational content if you want to learn anything, right? I mean, a lot of it's, some of it is deep education. I can find a woman in India that'll give me a six or eight hour tutorial on Selenium and automated testing if I want. By the way, I'll see 16 other competing tutorials on Selenium. Uh, I can take, you know, courses galore on nutrition or the like. You know, there's a guy called the Agimator. He's uploaded 1,000 videos on chess. Thousands and thousands and thousands. So sometimes it's pop culture. It's like, look at me, this is fun. Sometimes it's travel log. Sometimes it's like serious. So, uh, sometimes it's Khan Academy type stuff. It varies. But what you can see is just that this enormous thirst for thematic uh, knowledge coming in an in a easily consumable uh, format. <clears throat> so what do we have more of? We have a lot more compute and memory. What do we have less of? We have less attention span and less patience. You know, I joke with my customers that um, it used to be, if you roll the clock back 10 to 20 years, uh, a business person would run a query and they would wait, uh, and they're waiting a minute for the answer, and there's two other things they're thinking about. And today, if they have a question, they might wait five, three seconds, a couple of seconds, and there's 20 things they're thinking about. Your phone's ringing, your computer's ringing. There's, Apple like has, have you noticed like they have all these notification alerts and they're like, well, you can't, we're turning your notifications off and then you're getting hounded by every possible app to get permission to turn notifications back on. Your bank wants to notify you and your, your Facebook wants to notify you, and every other Insta something wants to notify you, and at some point you're like getting notified about everything, everywhere, all the time, and you can't keep up. So what's the most valuable resource on earth? It's the number of milliseconds between when somebody wants something and when they get it. And, uh, <clears throat> and the competition or, or the expectation is being set by Google. And Google has created something which is uh, smart and fast. So successful products everywhere in the world, things that are working, they, they have a couple of characteristics. One is they're smarter, and the other is they're faster, and the last is they're flawless. And Google is in a, a kind of example of that, in that when you start to ask Google a question, you know, like, uh, uh, who's gonna win the baseball match and you misspell baseball you know Google says did you mean who's winning the World Series right now you know and the answer is the Nationals you idiot you know like you asked the wrong <laughs> asked the wrong question the wrong way but I inferred what you wanted to ask and it's and you're like, oh yeah that's what I really wanted to say right you know, and it kind of, you know, it's kind of amusing, but if you're, if you study as computer scientists, you know, you kind of scratch your head and think, man, those, those engineers are so quick, right? Like, and then you just kind of feel sorry for their competitors. Because as you're typing, sometimes you'll type three letters. If you were to go into Google during the World Series and type B-A-S, it would probably say, Who's winning the baseball game right now, Washington Nationals? You know, like, you probably wouldn't get past B-A-S before it's giving you the thing. It's not waiting. And uh, uh, it, it takes me to an interesting point, which is if you've, got a, if you've got a product or a computer program, it's waiting for the user to ask the question or to do the thing, then it's sitting idle. Like, in the amount of time that I've spoken, my watch, you know, burned off enough cycles to have, like, launched 10 trips to the moon, calculated the ballistic trajectory, and come back, right? Like, but it didn't. 
You see, like it's just pouring computing power onto the floor, right? This is like more computing power than the Walmart Corporation had 20 years ago. And as I'm talking to you, what is it doing? Nothing. So then you end up with these companies asking, how do I get the computer to work 100 times harder? Because the only way to get ahead in the economy or ahead in the world is I have to tap into the unlimited, infinite, free, exploding, magical resource of the age. You know, 100 years ago is oil, gasoline, internal combustion engines. Now it's compute engines. How do I tap in the, well, how do I make the computer work 100 times harder? Well, how about, how do I make the computer work 100,000 times harder? Right? How, how do I build uh, something which is going to think and then do before you ask it to do something what you should ask it to do if you were sophisticated enough to know to ask? <coughs> well, there are examples of, of companies, that, the companies that are doing that and they're making incredible large heck loads of money. Google is one example we just talked about. Uh, Google does it in their search engine, and YouTube, they do it again. It's like, Lord help you, if you click on one, one little video on Frank Lloyd Wright houses, and then you look in the right, it's like, here's 18 Frank Lloyd Wright house tours, and then here's a documentary on Frank Lloyd Wright, and here's a documentary on houses built by acolytes of Frank Lloyd Wright, and here's discussion of architecture, and, you know, if you click on two, it will feed you a thousand hours worth of this stuff. And, it, and it, you've got to be careful what you click on because it will just overwhelm you with pet videos, videos on the keto diet, videos on chess, videos on whatever. And it's infinite, right? It's like, uh, yeah. There are guys that do, uh, they now do live chess commentary. So I want to paint this picture for you. That, you know, two world champion chess players will watch a game which is going to take four hours where the players are moving every ten minutes and for that nine hours they will give you a color commentary. Now think about how many thousands and thousands of hours of chess video you can watch and think about what you would accomplish in the year during which you watch that because there's 10 to the 120 different chess games out there. You could watch it 5,000 hours a year for the next 50 years and you won't get through 1%. It's just frightening, horrifyingly, terrifyingly entertaining, right? Uh, however you think about it. You really want to think, what does that mean to you? Well, um, another example yeah, of of um, of this uh, is Apple, you know, and it, it used to be Apple thought, well, we'll put the camera on the phone, and then they thought, well, we think we'll take the the picture, and then we'll do a little bit of software editing on the picture to make it look better, and then we'll give you a little filter, and then they thought, well, what if we actually took two pictures? And then we went through pixel by pixel, and we picked the best pixels of each of the two, you know, less shaky, and we put together one. And then they thought, well, why don't we just take 16 photos, each one is 5 megabytes, and we'll just go ahead and make 80 megabytes. And then in the background, we'll just go ahead and shuffle it all together and create this composite, but we're not going to tell you. And as you can see, and you can tell this is going on because... In the iPhone 10, you take the photo, and if you click the trigger to shutter too many times, it's the machine or the, the, the camera kind of stops and it delays. And then the iPhone 11, they improved the chip. It's like I had to invent some software, which is insanely expensive, so that I can give you a, or sell you a chip, which is insanely fast, so you would upgrade and throw away your old phone, right? Now, what's the key to that, right? You have to get away from analog and machines and you have to get into uh, software so that you can make the software work harder, right? This, right? this has got enough horsepower in it to listen to me speak, right? When is sunset? Sunset will be at 
5 p.m. today. A fiendishly expensive use of computing power, right? To listen to me speak and, you know, like, by the way, you want, want to see something even more expensive? What time is it? It's 1.25 p.m. Yeah. yeah, right? Like, I can answer the question by just glancing at it, or I can look at an analog, or I can create a chip which processes a billion instructions a second, listen, convert your voice into some stream, parse it, and, and then reverse it back into <clears throat> some, some uh, English semantic representation, look at the thing, and then, and then I can do a voice decoder thing, and I can synthesize speech, and I can tell you what time it is. Is that good for our society? Interesting. <clears throat> Well, it has implications. <clears throat> what are the implications, right? Well, first of all, um, you really better be educated. <laughs> you really better be educated. And uh, there are certain things that we want a lot more of right now. Um, if, you wanna, if you want to produce this sort of product, uh, which... Uh, which keeps getting better and better and better, which is drives the in, engine of the economy, then you have to be very precise and, uh, and very orderly in the way you communicate. <clears throat> Our company's values are precision, transparency, engagement, and agility. But they're, they're very much related to what you'd have to do if you want to write a piece of software or you want to get a lot of people to work together. Um, it's pretty, thank you, that's nice of you. Uh, it's, it's pretty clear that if you, don't, uh, if you don't get through all the basics, uh, all of the, the English and math and basic sciences and then, and then follow with logical thinking processes, uh, that uh, drive intellectual rigor, then it, you're not going to be able to contribute in any of these enterprises uh, that are building these things because they all are defined by lots of moving parts, like lots and lots of moving parts. At, um, at MicroStrategy, um, I think we, well, the CEO's control freak uh, and <laughs> And so one thing that the CEO did was he implemented a rule whereby he has to approve every single hire. And I think we hired five, 600 people last year, something like that. And uh, I don't have time to interview them all, but I want some degree of control. So we implemented a, a set of precise assessments. And whenever you want a job with us, it doesn't matter where you are, if you're in Poland, or if you're in Nigeria, or South Africa, or, or Malaysia, it could be anywhere, Japan, Korea. We give you um, uh, assessments uh, that give us an insight as to your analytic skills, your business judgment, your coding skills, your design, or, or creativity, free thinking, and, and graphical design skills, and, um, and uh, then English. And then after that, we might give you a French, German, Spanish, Japanese, Korean, or Portuguese test to assess that. And then we put that into the, um, into the record, and then that flows all the way up the, the entire organization. And there's some interviews, like four or five people might interview someone, and the HR people opine on it, and then the manager and their boss and the department head, and it gets all the way to me. And uh, What's interesting is what you find is that the resume very rarely is that um, useful. Um, in fact, the better the resume, sometimes the more skeptical I am. Like, if you have that good a resume, why are you looking for a job? <laughs> like, why do you want to work for me? Like, I don't want to be a member of a club where they would have me, right? Like, so, so, I mean, sometimes that's good to have a resume, but sometimes it's not good because the people that have failed in the last six jobs always have great resumes because they had lots of experience. Yeah. So maybe. Uh, and then the interviews. Well, I mean, some people interview well, but of course, the more you interview, the better you get at that, right? <laughs> and, uh, and so what I see is the resume, not so useful. 
the interviews may or may not be useful, you read a lot of stuff, you can't tell anything. The assessments, I look at the assessment in about one second, I can say, you can't write, you're going to be a great designer, you should build the graphic interface, you have really poor sense. You, you know, given, given 50 choices of what's beautiful, you made the wrong choice 25 times, right? <laughs> right? If you, if you, like, I can see that, or I can see, like, we ask business questions, like, you have a meeting, do you show up five minutes in advance, 15 minutes in advance, or two hours in advance, right? And if they say 15 minutes in advance, we're like, okay, that's good. Two hours, that's too soon. Five minutes is like cutting it way too close, right? Do, do you have common sense? Bottom line is, uh, oh, by the way, what didn't I mention? I didn't really mention the university. In fact, uh, I don't pay attention to what university anybody went to. I don't pay attention to what degree they got. And I don't pay attention to what grades they got. Uh, because they're all non-comparable, you can't tell. Uh, what I've found is that the best single indicator of success is uh, the one second of the objective assessments that we have. And uh, the, uh, the negative of what we do is we make, we make people take two hours of, or two and a half hours of assessments to actually give us that one second insight. The ideal situation, as I've spoken about in these previous events, would be if there was a universal set of assessments that someone could take once and they could submit those credentials to a thousand different employers. And then instead of taking two hours to go through the employer's battery of assessments, you could go through the two, uh, the two hours of assessments once, uh, put them on the blockchain or upload them, you know, and then, uh, you know, if you think about the implication, it doesn't just speed up your uh, process by two hours because if you did it 10 times, it would cut 20 hours out of your life of waste. But it doesn't just make you 20 hours faster. When you actually get to something which is um, a public, uh, a public uh, shared standard, then you could go and post those assessments online and be considered by 800,000 employers in five minutes. Right? So you've securitized the talent. Right? Like, if you, uh, if you tell me you have a bunch of Apple stock and you'll sell it to me for 120 bucks a share and it was trading at $260 a share, it takes me one second to decide I want to buy, right? Because we've got a very precise definition of the security and the price. So if you want to actually buy and sell talent and you're, you're a, a would-be employee or a would-be employer, Right, then, um, then the best way to, uh, to speed that up and create a liquid market is, is to post a public credential that is well understood and shared. And uh, the, the real interesting thing is, if I, could go, uh, if I could go online and I could pick my city, if I could go to Hangzhou or go to Warsaw or go to Paris and just hire 27 people that hit these credentials, I might do that in a day. I would do that in a day and I would pay for the 27 people as opposed to take two years and hire three recruiters and pay half a million dollars in headhunting fees in order to get, you know, half of that. So the, um, the market is becoming uh, more liquid and uh, I'm, I'm enormously excited by um, the potential of these uh, public credentials. You know, what Accredibly is doing, what we're doing at the Sailor Academy. It's very, very interesting. Put your credential on the blockchain. And um, you can see um, this is being driven by uh, big tech in a lot of ways. Google and, uh, and uh, Microsoft and Amazon are all driving these big cloud initiatives. And one of the interesting characteristics of that is, so a corporation like Pfizer wants to put all their processing in the cloud. Once it goes into the cloud in AWS or Azure, let's say, they need people to tinker with it and administer it and run it. Well, how do they find those people? Where are those people? Well, it doesn't matter where they are right? Because it's in the cloud anyway. They could be in anywhere. They could be in Africa. They could be in Asia. They could be in America. 
So the migration of all of the computing to the cloud is a globalization of the labor pool. Now it also turns out that, um, that when we want to run uh, a customer's uh, intelligence environment in the AWS cloud, we have to take our people and put them through an AWS set of classes. So we go online in AWS and they go through like 40 hours or 80 hours with the classes in Linux and system administration and AWS and the like. And at the end there's a certification and you take a test and you submit it and you get graded and if you're successful you get a certificate. And that certificate you can then post on your LinkedIn and, uh, and that uh, becomes a pretty big uh, career stamp. And uh, you know what happens next? Our person gets a certificate and then they get headhunted away by somebody else. <laughs> because there's massive demand for people that have that skill. So, so uh, that's the first order of fact and then we end up sitting and talking about it and we go, well gosh, I guess we better give them a raise as soon as they get that certificate. Yeah. So we had a situation where we were um, slow as an employer we go to some place, China or Warsaw or anywhere in the world, and we hire a lot of people, and then we train them, and then uh, they get skills, and then uh, you know other companies competing with us, including you know big tech and all the integrators, they hire our people because they think, well, this this is great. You trained all these people, we can hire them. This is good. So when we're when we uh, give them raises of five percent a year or three percent a year we have 25 or 30 percent turnover. So then we start thinking, well, we better give them a career path that's a bit more precise uh, and say, well, when you hit this level, we'll move you to here. When you hit this level, we'll move you to here and, and here and here. And if we do that, and if we're rigorous about it, then our turnover goes from 25 or 30 percent to 5 percent, 3 percent. So uh, what is that? Well, that is the visible hand of the market spanking us for being bad employers and reminding us that if we don't actually cultivate our talent and take care of them and give them an inspiring path and then make sure we pay them, then some other company will and they will solve the problem. And uh, when you put together the idea of objective credentials with the idea of globalization, with the idea of liquid, you know, uh, cross-border flows of labor, with the rise of big tech, it really means that somebody in Nigeria can get their AWS certificate and potentially be just as employable as somebody in Manhattan. And maybe I want them more. Um, and that, uh, what does that mean? Well, that means that, uh, an AWS or Azure or the like certification is becoming more important than a Harvard or a Yale degree. Because I can tell you, like, in my uh, meetings when I sit, when we sit around and talk, what I hear is, well, we need 50 cloud engineers, we need 30 of these people, we need 25 of these people, we need 50 of these. There's no one that ever sits in a meeting with me and says, we need five more Harvard grads. We need 25 Yale grads. Like, Nobody ever asked for a credential by the name of a, of a traditional institution. They're wanting a tech capability or it is either a basic or more likely it's an advanced certification. So that is driving and you know, uh, it's going to ripple through everything, right? Because the numbers we're talking about are, they're not tens of thousands, they might be hundreds of thousands, but they're really likely millions and millions and millions of uh, people being infected and going to tens of millions and then hundreds of millions. And uh, the, um, the motive uh, or the motor on this becomes uh, a company like Cognizant with 250,000 knowledge workers about to hire 150,000 more, you know. <laughs> they're, uh, they're really wanting to go at this in a, in a machine-like way. So, you know, what have we done? Uh, it's driven us to uh, define our roles much more precisely. Like now, uh, we're, all the companies that are successful, they're building software that's reusable and then building roles and certificates uh, that, 
that are essential for the ecosystem so that you can train and certify practitioners to use those tools and then you want to build your own ecosystem up and uh, after you've defined the roles you can define the credentials then you can issue the credentials then you can issue them publicly and uh, and then you end up with you know 10,000 microstrategy architects or 50,000 hyper intelligence engineers um, The, the first order observation I have is that if you've got a product or a service offering like that that you can automate and then you can uh, massively scale up uh, the creation of that talent, then you can grow and you can prosper. If you, if you can't, then you just keep getting squeezed every single year by someone else that is. Uh, the second order observation I have is like, if I think about every internal project at my company, like everything, when we sit about and we talk about what are we going to do to make 2020 better than 2019 or 2021 better, when, if you define the word hope, every, every hopeful project consists of, in essence, the relentless drive to organize and automate using some software tool. We're either trying to build software faster or writing specifications in a more orderly uh, automated way or documentation or courses or certifications, managing projects, opportunities, contracts, quotes, marketing campaigns, schedules, any miscellaneous activity, any purchase, any hire decision, any promotion decision, any transfer decision. They're all just many software projects using a tool. It's either a a compiler, it's GitHub, or it's Salesforce, or it's Workday, or it's MicroStrategy, but invariably we're building something to build something else in order to create 10,000 of the something so that we can do 100,000, so we can squeeze something down from taking 47 minutes to four minutes to 40 seconds to four seconds to 0.4 seconds till we get to the point where we can do 27,000 of them in 0.4 seconds, right? And, and the only way you do that is just relentlessly model, test, machine, install, deploy, pilot, rebuild. If you're not manufacturing an outcome, then you just literally can't keep up in the modern world because your competition is some enterprise that is manufacturing an outcome. So, I guess that uh, takes me to my closing thoughts. Um, it seems pretty obvious uh, that if you want to do a good thing for the world, it's undebatable that if we can increase the level of education everywhere on the planet, and whatever it is, if, if you don't have a high school degree, get you on. If you don't have a college degree, get you on. If you don't have uh, a master's or a technical skill get you on. If, if we can create PhDs, create PhDs. We need to create more and we need to do it cheaper. And in, in the limit where we can offer any type of education you might want at the cost of zero. And by, and by the way, I, I can't see any reason why we shouldn't get there because the cost to provide all, all the critical types of education has got to be 1% of what we're spending right now on, on similar things or irrelevant things. So, and the cost of the compute power is just falling exponentially uh, and will continue to fall exponentially. So this is a straightforward thing that we all, I think we're all joined here together in a belief this is a good idea. I think uh, the success comes one part marketing. How do we actually market this and communicate this to the world so we can do that? And part of it is politics. How do we get political accreditors to embrace uh, open learning and endorse it? And then part of it is the product. If you know. It used to be that everybody used Netscape and then 96% of the planet used Explorer, but today 80% of the planet uses Chrome. Why? 
smarter, faster, better, right? Make the product better, make everything better. You know, you look at your courses, you're like, are these boring or are these fun? These are boring, we need to make them fun, right? It's fun, is it in black and white or color? Okay, well, if it's black and white, we can make it color. Can we make it easier? Can we make it uh, more, uh, more elegant? Can we give it more feedback? And we're always trying to figure out how do you create that awesome, incredible product. And, uh, and then ultimately we've just got, we've got history on our side, bit by bit, every quarter, every year, more and more in the world embraces this, the world opens up. And I think that, uh, I think there's no doubt where the trend is going. If, uh, when we look at our own stats, on the Sailor Academy, it's clear there's more enthusiasm every quarter, every year. We're picking up momentum. So for everybody that's involved in the, in the space or in the ecosystem, uh, I want to uh, thank you for having an interest in, and for your commitment. A lot of people are making big sacrifices to support this particular initiative. Um, we're happy uh, that you joined us today. We'd love to help and partner with you any way we possibly can. And uh, I can't think of a better way to spend our time and our energy than do something like this. Ultimately, I can't see that anything but good will come of it. So thank you. Very good. If you look at your agenda, we're going to take a break for about 15 minutes or so and then come back here at 2.15 uh, for the next panel. So thank you, everybody. Appreciate it.